Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John Pfeffer and I work for the uh, Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC, where I direct the Foreign Policy and Focus Project and our Global Just Transition uh, Initiative. I'm delighted that we're able to offer this uh, event on the question of climate debt and climate reparations. Uh, we have a very exciting panel uh, with us this evening, and I'm going to shortly pass it over to our uh, excellent moderator, uh, Liliana Butrago. And Liliana is a member of the Eco Social Pact of the South, uh, our co sponsor for this event. Um, I want to direct your attention to uh, the translation function at the bottom. If you need translation to English or to Spanish, uh, just indicate in the bottom and you will automatically get translation. Um, I think this is a, an extraordinarily important question uh, that is increasingly in mainstream debate. Uh, and I'll just say one thing about this. Perhaps some of you saw the recent New Yorker uh, article on the floods in Pakistan, and it occasioned the question here in the body of the article, isn't it time for rich nations to pay the communities that they have helped to drown? And I think that is the essential question, not just for, uh, in the case of Pakistan, but for so many other countries that are facing the consequences of the climate crisis today. I'll put that link in the chat. If you have questions, we have a Q&A function. So please uh, put your questions in the Q&A function and your comments in chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the, uh, the baton over to Liliana. And thank you again for joining us today. Over to you, Liliana. Muchísimas gracias, Tom. Un saludo a todas, a todos, todes, desde acá, desde Latinoamérica. Mi nombre es Liliana Huitrago y como les ha indicado John, hago parte del Pacto Ecosocial del Sur y del Observatorio de Ecología Política de Venezuela. Eh, este foro para nosotros es sumamente importante porque además pone en debate eh, varias cosas que hemos estado discutiendo desde nuestro espacio, desde el Pacto Ecosocial del Sur, atendiendo a estas preguntas tan importantes que señala John, que tienen que ver precisamente con lo que deben ¿no? los países más ricos del mundo a los países más pobres en términos de deuda climática, y cuál podría ser la mejor manera de utilizar esos recursos para ayudar al sur global a cerrar la brecha de desarrollo sin agotar ¿no? este, los recursos naturales del resto del mundo. ¿Cuáles son esas perspectivas de cumplir realmente las promesas de los gobiernos eh, del norte, que el norte han hecho a los pueblos del sur? ¿no? Y para responder un poco a estas preguntas, hoy nos acompañan tres expertos en la cuestión de la deuda climática y las reparaciones que abordarán estas cuestiones, estas preguntas, en lo que queremos que sea un debate provocador que nos deje reflexiones interesantes, pero además que nos ayude a construir eh, formas también para eh, contestar, pero no solo contestar, sino iniciar acciones conjuntas desde los sures globales en el marco del de llamado que hacemos los pueblos de los sures para la descarbonización en una agenda mucho más amplia, para articular la justicia redistributiva de género, étnica, eh, ambiental, para la construcción de sociedades y economías realmente post-extractivistas y más allá de las falsas soluciones. Eh, en primer lugar, nos acompaña Mina. Eh, Mina Raman es presidenta de Amigos de la Tierra, Malasia y directora de programas de la Red del Tercer Mundo. Ha participado activamente en las negociaciones intergubernamentales eh, sobre el clima con una amplia experiencia por muchísimos años en los movimientos por justicia climática. Bienvenida, Mina. Eh, quisiéramos dejarte, por favor, en la palabra. 
Gracias por estar y aceptar la invitación a este debate. Uh, good, very good morning to all of you. Um, sorry, good evening. I am uh, 12 hours ahead of you coming from Malaysia. And uh, so that is why it's morning and the sun is rising. Um, very happy to be here and thank you to the organizers for this event. Um, on the issue of climate justice, I think, and climate debt, I think just to put the context of where we are coming from, I'm not assuming that everybody understands that concept, um, but it has its roots, not just in moral and ethical, and, and it also has legal dimensions. Um, and so just basically to say that uh, as developing countries, of course, history of colonialism, history of slavery, history of, um, you know, since the industrial revolution with the emissions that have been emitted into the atmosphere, the greenhouse gases since 1850, which are now the um, reason for a lot of that suffering and drowning that is going around the world. And so we have to take this into context from a very historical perspective. And given that history and perspective, uh, as we all already know, the disproportionate use or overconsumption of what is known as the carbon space or the carbon budget. And whether you take a two degree limit of temperature rise since the industrial era or the 1.5 degree rise within, um, from the pre-industrial times. And just to note that we are already on a 1.1 degree warming uh, increase uh, already now. So we have very limited carbon space left. And if you look at um, just below 20% of the world population, which is in the rich north, global north, over consuming more than 70% of the carbon budget already historically. This is really unfair and unjust and disproportionate. And that's where the emissions debt comes from. Those who have become rich in a world that was unfettered by just emitting large amounts of greenhouse gases have caused much of the, res are responsible for much of the destruction and devastation we are facing today. So the origins of the emissions debt, the origins of what's called the adaptation debt, and we are in the era of what's also called loss and damage. Uh, many countries, uh, even if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, and if you look at their recent reports, the room and window for adaptation, which means you adjust to climate impacts is fast closing, not only the window for emissions reductions, um, but also the window for adaptation. And what we are already seeing is moving into the realm of loss and damage, where there is real suffering, which is happening as um, we have seen in the Pakistan floods, in the Nigeria recently, and even in the rich world itself. So it's not peculiar to just the global South. But, um, and there is this notion of what's called carbon colonialism. I just wanted to put that on, uh, on the table. It isn't just civil society even talking about it, including you have the like-minded developing countries in Glasgow who said this, and they have said this because what you see happening is that instead of doing the massive emission reductions that needs to be done, and in fact, going beyond zero, which is not not zero, we are against net zero, Net zero by 2050 is doing too little too late. The developed world should have gone to beyond net zero by now, but they are not. So they have crafted what's called net zero by 2050 by all, which is actually postponing the emissions reductions that, that need to happen now. And just to say that with the Ukraine um, crisis that you have seen the war, um, what's already happening is that they've reversed on many of their um, ways of moving forward, but they have actually backtracked by going back into the use of fossil fuels, including coal, even in a country like Germany. So we are in a world that is really very scary because um, there are climate deniers, of course, led uh, by the United States still. 50% um, of the United States still is living in denial. And then you do have a very difficult uh, world at this moment. So given all that backdrop um, with the historical injustice, what is it that we are talking about in terms of the climate debt that is old. And this is where we get into the history of the legal provisions. I mean, the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol, they're all legal. It's not just because it is an ethical or moral issue, as I said, 
the, it's embedded in the um, framework convention that historical emissions have originated largely from the developed world. And as a result of which, the developed world is obliged, is a legal commitment to provide the financial, technological, and the capacity building resources to the developing world. So these commitments, which were already there since 1992, um, and the framework convention took into effect in 1994. And since then, if you look at what has actually been delivered in terms of real financial resources, whether in terms of finance or technology transfers, very, very little. And um, just to say that what we have witnessed recently um, in 2010, if those of you who remember, there was this promise about of, of delivering on 100 billion per year by 2020. This was a pledge that was made to actually in Copenhagen, if you remember the year before, when President Obama and Hillary Clinton were in Copenhagen, suddenly there was like, oh, you know, that we have got huge climate ambition, we are going to save the world. And what they came up with was this $100 billion pledge by 2020. And that $100 billion was just plucked from a hat. It wasn't based on any needs or assessment of what the developing countries needed. And then when we arrived in Paris in 2021, um, uh, that $100 billion goal was uh, you know, shifted to delivery by 2025. So another five-year postponement of that goal. And until today, and as we move towards um, the COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt, this delivery of 100 billion, we are still waiting for it. And the numbers are all over the place. They will, the developed world counts everything, including loans, even insurance, and they classify that as delivering on the climate finance. But of course, all of that is um, a mix and fudge of numbers. And what we really know is that the delivery of the 100 billion per year is basically the conclusion is that they've not delivered as yet. So are not a broken promise. Now, if you look at the Green Climate Fund, this was a very important fund that was set up because the developing countries pushed for it um, and under the G77 and China, which is the grouping of developing countries. Since the inception of the Green Climate Fund, which is in, based in Songdo in South Korea, they were, since, the, since its inception, what we understand is that in 2014, since 2014, only $13.9 billion has been delivered. And so very little, if you can see in terms of the scale of what's been delivered. If you look at the Adaptation Fund, which is another very important fund um, under the Kyoto Protocol, and which is now also going to serve serving the Paris Agreement, since um, 2007, only at, uh, about $1.5 billion has been delivered. So very small. But if you look at the scale of what developing countries have been asking, um, in terms of what's called the new collective goal on finance, there is a negotiations which is going right now underway um, for a new collective goal on finance, quantified goal on finance, based on the needs and priorities of developing countries. This is a very important discussion and negotiation. And what we discover is that based on the needs of developing countries, the um, Standing Committee on Finance, which is a body which is looking at all these numbers and reports, they have actually come up with a report which shows that developing countries actually need in the order of five to $11 trillion to implement what uh, Paris obligations are and uh, all the needs that they have identified. But this is only based on 30% of the cost which has, which has been costed. By and large, 70% of this has not been costed. So we're talking about five to 11 trillion uh, by 2030 and for only 30% of the cost. And so this is still a very small number. And then if you look at the UNEP um, adaptation gap report, the United Nations Environment Program in 2016, they estimated that finance annually for adaptation for developing countries is in the order of 140 to 300 billion per year by 2030 and 280 to 500 billion by 2050. And this is based on a scenario of a two to four degree world temperature rise. Now the latest IPCC estimates say that for adaptation alone, this is much more, 400 billion in annual costs by 2030 to 1 trillion by 2050. 
So the scale of what we are talking about is phenomenal. It's huge. And of course, even with Pakistan, as we know, there's the 300 million people um, who have been, 30, sorry, 30 million people who have suffered and um, 30, 30 billion in dollars of damages we've already witnessed. And then of course, we are not even talking about loss and damage in terms of what the finance is needed. And that loss and damage, which is beyond adaptation, one study actually projects in the order of 290 billion to 580 billion for economic losses alone. So we are in a world of billions and trillions, but we are now dealing in the green, I mean, with the um, discussions, which is very, very small in what is actually been delivered. And the final uh, few points that I'd like to make, we have to look at the scale of this crisis in its proper context. It's not about there being no money, there is money. It's about the political will. Just to say that we have to also connect this with the debt justice movement. It's the climate justice and the debt justice movement have to go in together because currently many, many countries in the developing world with the pandemic and with the economic crisis are in a serious debt crisis. Um, and we will probably hear more of, about that. So the financial crisis plus, uh, which has led to the the, you know, driven really by the history of colonialism and the post-colonialism and the kind of structural, um, you know, uh, adjustment policies by the World Bank and the IMF and all of that combined and leading to a very difficult world today in climate, in not only a climate distress, a debt distress. And so much of the climate finance, which is also being talked about, is being talked about in the context of much more loans. So you can't have more loans to debt distressed countries to address their climate challenge. So the developing world is already challenged in meeting their basic human needs and, 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 and uh, survival needs of their countries. And for some countries is even an existential threat that coupled with the climate debt is really, really quite phenomenal. So we do need to talk about debt cancellation as part of reparations. There is this also big call for the re um, progressive redistribution of the IMF um, special drawing rights. Now, I just want to very quickly talk about the special drawing rights. Increasingly around the world, we have seen the emergence of right-wing governments, which is very shocking, even in Sweden, even in, in relators in Italy and uh, in the UK, extreme, um, you know, worst forms of government now. And so you can't be expecting them to be very multilateral. We are going to be seeing a, back, uh, a backtracking. Uh, multilateralism is actually under challenge at the moment. But there is this IMF uh, currency called the special drawing rights. I won't go into details. But when the developed world was in crisis after the pandemic, $650 billion of special drawing rights was issued by the IMF for the rich countries. So they can do this, but they are not going to be doing this for the developing world. And the final point is that Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados, speaking for a large number of islands, very strongly called not only in Glasgow, but also further in the UNGA General Assembly most recently, for an annual issuance of $5 billion, $500 billion of, of special drawing rights. This is a potential that if the political will, particularly of the United States, unfortunately, because they have enormous decision-making power, even as to the SDRs, so this SDRs is a very important way of, um, of going forward if the world is really concerned. Um, we are concerned, but I'm not so sure about the government, but we as civil society have to, have to push for that. And the final point is just to give you a scale of what we're talking about, fossil fuel subsidies of the G7 countries annually, annually every year, the G7 countries provide at least $100 billion of fossil fuel subsidies. Now, this is really going in the wrong direction. It's a wasted resource, and that can be easily channeled to the developing world to address not only its climate um, crisis, but also its development crisis as we see it right now. So I'll stop there. I'm sure there is enough. Uh, I've provoked enough people for an exciting discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Ciertamente, ¿no? los retos en este momento son mayores. Las posibilidades de incidencia en muchos de los espacios se limitan incluso por el tipo de reuniones que cada vez se hacen más distantes, 
más cerradas y en contextos eh, con muchísimo más autoritarismo alrededor, por lo que a la sociedad civil cada vez le cuesta más incidir en los espacios de las COP. Eh, y, y realmente las decisiones se están tomando, eh, como decimos, este... En el, en, en, desde las plataformas como la Plataforma por la Justicia Climática, eh, aquí en, en Latinoamérica, el Pacto Ecosocial del Sur, los, los espacios de diversos debates, los diálogos sur-sur que hemos tenido con compañeras y compañeros diversos, en un marco de profunda injusticia y de expansión energética en lugar de una verdadera transición justa. Quisiera darle la palabra a Alberto Acosta, quien es parte del Pacto Ecosocial del Sur, el ex exministro de Energía y Minas de Ecuador, es el presidente de la Asamblea, fue presidente de la Asamblea Constituyente que consagró los derechos de la madre naturaleza en la Constitución del Ecuador eh, y, bueno, eh, con amplia experiencia en temas sobre las diversas deudas, las deudas eternas, como decimos, desde los espacios de debate que compartimos siempre con él. Muchas gracias, Alberto, por, la, por estar aquí con nosotras y, y, bueno, la palabra es tuya. Empiezo saludándoles desde los Andes. Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches a todas aquellas personas que en las distintas partes del planeta nos están escuchando. Para mí es especialmente grato poder compartir algunas reflexiones, sobre todo luego de la introducción que nos hace Mina. Sin lugar a dudas, vemos y hemos visto en los últimos tiempos cómo los problemas ambientales se han disparado en el planeta. Ya no podemos seguir hablando simplemente de un cambio climático, porque cambios climáticos ha habido una y otra vez en la larga historia geológica de la Tierra. Lo que estamos viviendo, sin lugar a dudas, es una suerte de colapso climático provocado por la acción de los seres humanos. Siendo una realidad aquello del antropoceno, los seres humanos que están afectando el equilibrio de la madre tierra, es una verdad a medias o una falsedad. Porque no somos todos los seres humanos, sino que somos los seres humanos en general, los grupos privilegiados, en un ejercicio propio de acumulación del sistema capitalista. La historia de la modernidad, la historia del capitalismo, se nutre de la expansión de la voracidad por acumular, tener cada vez más, en un proceso en el que se fueron marginando otros horizontes civilizatorios, afectando a los pueblos y nacionalidades indígenas, afectando los cuerpos y las subjetividades de millones de habitantes del planeta, en primer lugar, sin lugar a dudas, de las mujeres y se fueron destruyendo las relaciones de armonía con la naturaleza. Este es un entorno que yo creo que tiene que quedarnos absolutamente claro. Estamos viendo problemas que comienzan a englobar al planeta entero. El caso de Pakistán. Lo que estamos este rato viendo y están viviendo millones de personas en el Caribe por efecto de un huracán que está también golpeando a los propios Estados Unidos. Y estamos viendo cómo la humanidad no encuentra, usemos un término más apropiado, sus dirigentes no encuentran una respuesta adecuada. Mina nos mencionaba, por ejemplo, algo que me llamó mucho la atención desde hace tiempo atrás. Se planteó como una medida para enfrentar el cambio climático, este colapso climático, el establecimiento de un fondo para abordar estas demandas urgentes, enormes, Mina mencionó las cifras, son cifras cuantiosas, pero esos 100 mil millones de dólares que se establecieron como meta en Copenhague en el año, ya son como 10 años. Luego tenemos en, en la cumbre de París en el 2015 y recientemente en el 2021 no han sido siquiera concebidos. ¿Y qué es lo que estamos viviendo? Que por efecto de la invasión rusa a Ucrania, las prioridades comienzan a cambiar. Mena también mencionaba cómo en los países europeos se vuelve nuevamente al uso de las energías fósiles, a la energía nuclear. Y un dato que es muy interesante, se planteó un fondo de 100 mil millones de dólares que no ha podido ser todavía completado, pero en muy poco tiempo, en un tiempo récord, en un solo país europeo, un país muy rico, se destinaron prácticamente en una noche 100 mil millones de dólares 
para armar el ejército alemán, para armar adicionalmente al ejército alemán. Esto me lleva entonces a una cuestión de fondo. Tenemos que entender cómo se fueron forjando estas diversas deudas eternas, las digo yo, desde hace mucho tiempo atrás. Hay un entramado de poder que desembocó en la apropiación y subordinación de los cuerpos y de las subjetividades, de los territorios donde hay recursos naturales, de la marginación de los pueblos en tanto portadores de sus propias culturas y de destrucción de la naturaleza. Este es el escenario en el cual nosotros tenemos que hablar de las deudas en plural, deudas que tienen que ver con el patriarcado, deudas que tienen que ver con la explotación del trabajo, deudas que tienen que ver con la colonialidad o el racismo, deudas que tienen que ver con distintas formas de expropiación y el saqueo de la naturaleza. Es importante entonces abordar esta estructura de dominación y las deudas que van de la mano de esta realidad tan compleja y perversa. Tenemos deudas públicamente aceptadas, aceptadas como tales, la deuda externa, la deuda, eh, la deuda financiera, que desde sus comienzos ha sido un instrumento de control, de dominación y de sumisión de los pueblos del mal llamado tercer mundo, de los mal llamados países en desarrollo, países empobrecidos por el sistema, si ustedes quieren, subdesarrollados por el sistema. Pero hay otras deudas ocultas o ocultadas por las estructuras de poder que se explican por, como resultado de esa dominación, dominación colonial, dominación social, dominación patriarcal, dominación climática. Entonces, en ese contexto nosotros tenemos en primer lugar que tener claridad de lo que significa esa deuda acumulada a través de las relaciones comerciales y financieras. Es una gran deuda a través de los cuales los países de la periferia se han visto permanentemente desangrados. La expansión del capital financiero no se difundió solo con el comercio, sino con inversiones y créditos. Yo creo que este es un primer elemento fundamental. Y Amena decía, hay que dar paso a la anulación de esas deudas que tienen unos orígenes corruptos de su esencia y que constituyen instrumentos que van generando cada vez más subordinación de los países pobres. En ese contexto, por ejemplo, para atender esas deudas, hay que incrementar las actividades extractivistas con mayor destrucción ambiental y eso incrementa la deuda climática, a la cual me voy a referir con más detalle un poco más adelante. Pero tenemos también una flexibilización de las relaciones laborales, se incrementa la explotación del trabajo y sobre todo se precariza el trabajo femenino y se, se agudiza entonces la crisis de los cuidados, lo que directa o indirectamente termina por andar tanto la deuda patriarcal como las otras deudas históricas. Para atender las deudas financieras, para pagar la deuda externa, hay que hacer enormes sacrificios sociales. Se deja de invertir en educación, en salud, en vivienda, en resolver los mismos problemas ambientales que genera este sistema. Y entonces crece la deuda social que se refleja en la pobreza y en las desigualdades. En ese contexto me parece a mí que es muy importante asumir el tema de la deuda climática en una visión de una crisis sistémica y una crisis multifacética que tiene una característica base. Los desastres vinculados al colapso climático no son el resultado de un proceso natural de la madre tierra, sino que son provocados por los seres humanos, el capitaloceno. El antropoceno puede ser verdad a priori, pero si analizamos un poco más nos vamos a encontrar que es un gran engaño. Es el sistema capitalista el responsable de todas estas deudas que están íntimamente interrelacionadas. Y aparece entonces aquí esa otra deuda eterna que nos ha convocado el día de hoy. No se trata, digo yo, de una simple deuda climática. Esta es una deuda ecológica que tiene varias explicaciones, varias razones que configuran esta nueva deuda o esta deuda que comienza a aparecer, que estuvo ahí presente, pero que cobra cada vez más fuerza. En primer lugar, esta deuda ecológica se debe a la expoliación colonial, la extracción de recursos minerales de las antiguas colonias y de los países subdesarrollados o empobrecidos en su búsqueda perversa del desarrollo. 
provocado por las plantaciones para exportar al mercado mundial. Vemos cómo se quema la Amazonía, por ejemplo, para incrementar la producción de soya y vender proteína vegetal para que se produzca proteína animal para alimentar sobre todo a los más ricos del planeta. La, tam, la tala masiva de bosques naturales para mencionar otro caso. Un segundo punto, hay una transferencia de bienes naturales del sur al norte global para alimentar los procesos industriales con materia prima sin considerar los costos ecológicos. No se consideran los impactos ecológicos, por ejemplo, provocados por la mega minería o por, provocados por la extracción de petróleo. Un tercer punto que incorpora en esta deuda ecológica, el aprovechamiento gratuito del espacio ambiental de los países empobrecidos por efecto del estilo de vida depredador de los países industrializados. Bien sabemos que el 10% más rico de la población mundial es responsable del 49% de los gases de efecto invernadero y un 50% de la población mundial apenas es responsable de un 10% de los gases de efecto invernadero. Anotemos otros temas en esta deuda ecológica. El traslado de las industrias más contaminantes, los monocultivos más invasivos y los depósitos de basura tóxica que están siendo llevados hacia los países periféricos y dependientes. Y en estos mismos días, con aquel objetivo, con el cual en principio estoy de acuerdo, de descarbonizar la atmósfera, de reducir la dependencia de los combustibles fósiles, vemos cómo hay una transición energética corporativa que resuelve los problemas ambientales, por ejemplo, de contaminación del aire en los países más ricos a costa de incrementar, por ejemplo, la minería en los países más pobres. Para tener autos eléctricos, hay que incrementar los procesos de explotación de minerales de litio del cobre en los países del sur. Para tener, por ejemplo, más rotores para la generación de energía eólica, se incrementa la destrucción de los bosques tropicales en muchas partes, buscando esa madera tez tan noble como la balsa. Y claro, todos estos daños se incrementan con el control que hay sobre algo que parecería obvio, la libertad de las semillas. A las semillas se les quiere incorporar en un esquema de dominación a través de lo que se conoce como las semillas geneta, genéticamente modificadas. Y a lo anterior se asuma la biopiratería, que es impulsada por las grandes transnacionales, que se apropian vía patentes de las plantas y conocimientos de los pueblos originarios. Digamos, para ir concluyendo esta primera aproximación, que ya no solo se saquean los metales preciosos, el oro, la plata, el cobre u otros metales, o los recursos naturales, Hidro, hidrocarburíferos, el carbón, el gas, el petróleo, sino que se está saqueando hasta el alma de los pueblos en su conocimiento ancestral. Y entonces, en este contexto, podemos afirmar que no solo hay un intercambio comercial y financieramente desigual, como plantean algunas reflexiones que ya las conocemos como las teorías de la dependencia, sino que también existe un intercambio ecológicamente desigual, que es en esencia desequilibrado y desequilibrador. En suma, hay una deuda ecológica de la humanidad al conjunto del planeta, sí, pero hay que destacar que son las élites las mayores causantes de estos destrozos. El capitalismo en tanto civilización de la desigualdad está provocando y accionando para incrementar estas destrucciones. Y entonces, en ese contexto, lo que tenemos es que recuperar las posibilidades de que la especie humana se mantenga en el planeta. Esto implica proteger selvas, territorios, mares, pero además transformar nuestros modos de vida, transformar nuestras relaciones y nuestras formas de producción y consumo. Aquí quiero concluir simplemente anotando lo siguiente. No se trata solo de que nos entreguen una cantidad importante de dinero para atender esas demandas que están provocadas por el colapso climático. Insisto, colapso climático más que simple cambio climático, sino que tenemos que caminar en la transformación profunda de las estructuras de dominación. Tenemos que construir otras estructuras de producción y de consumo. Tenemos que dar paso a una gran transformación que reconozca como punto de partida y que garantice 
la vigencia de la justicia social y de la justicia ecológica, de los derechos humanos y los derechos de la naturaleza. Solo de esta manera podremos resolver los graves problemas existentes. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Alberto, por tu brillante, además, participación. Eh, nos plantean cosas muy interesantes, Mina. Una de ellas es precisamente poder ir más allá de la de debate sobre lo climático, sobre el clima y poder abordar la problemática en el marco de sus dimensiones sociales, económicas, de género, eh, desde el punto de vista además del, de una crisis profunda de los cuidados, como asomaba Alberto, eh, y, y realmente esto enmarcado en una eh, en la perpetuación de una situación de colonialidad para los sures, como bien decían los compañeros, eh, y me pongo a pensar además, ¿no? y sé que vamos a poder debatir un poco más adelante sobre ello, cómo las falsas soluciones que se están implementando eh, siguen perpetuando estos patrones de, o este mandato de explotación, ¿no? como señala nuestra compañera Maristela Esbampa también del Pacto Ecosocial del Sur, eh, aspectos muy interesantes, pero bueno, quisiéramos escuchar también a uno de nuestros invitados, él es Tom Atanasio, el cofundador de Eco Equity, que ha sido coordinador del Grupo de Trabajo sobre Equidad de la Red de Acción Climática Internacional eh, entre las Cumbres del Clima de 2009 en Copenhague y 2015 en París. Muchísimas gracias, Tom, por aceptar esta invitación y estar acá eh, conversando con nosotros. La palabra es tuya. Estás muteado, me parece, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. hello. My name is Tom Athanasiu, and um, and my biggest claim to fame is that I have been tracking equity and and fair shares work within the climate negotiations for over 20 years now. Um, I'm, I'm the co-director of the Climate Equity Reference Project, which is, is, uh, has been working on the problem of what kind of international climate regime would be fair enough to actually work. Um, so I'm not gonna talk much about reparations or even climate reparations, but, but, but I am going to talk about climate debt, which is a topic I know well. And I'm going to talk about the fair shares approach, which builds on and transforms the climate debt approach. Um, so, so before doing that, because in a way I, uh, in a way it's a, it's a bit different than what's been said before, I want to, to be very clear about the fact that I agree with most everything that Mina and Alberto have said. The, the rich have immense debts to the poor and the, they are hardly limited to climate debts. So if you look at the countries in the world today that have the highest climate vulnerability indexes that are the most vulnerable to, to climatic and ecological destabilization, you will find that they are almost all ex-colonies. So that tells you a lot right there. And as for the rich, most of them live in the rich countries of the global north, and there's absolutely no way we're going to stabilize the climate system unless we face this basic truth. The question, the question before us is how we're going to do so how we're going to face this truth in a way that helps us to move very, very quickly. For as you will have noticed, we are out of time. Uh, we have to mobilize fast and we have to do it in a way that gets even faster, that builds the international solidarity that we will need to very, very quickly phase out fossil fuels globally. And, that, and given the way that things are going, I'm thinking in particular about the science of tipping points and tipping cascades. This requires us to drive global emissions down to zero by mid-century, approximately. Um, 
mid-century would not be too soon. And, and, and the point I want to make is a point that we all know, but I want to call it out and force us to look at it, which is that this will be very, very hard. This will be about the hardest thing that this would be hard even if we had functioning democracies and, and, and responsible leadership. And we don't have either one of those things. And, and in fact, we have a situation in which very powerful people stand to lose a great deal of money of, by phasing out the fossil fuel industry. So, so, so regardless of how we frame the problems here, we can call them climate debt, we can talk about climate reparations, we can talk about climate fair shares. The challenges are immense not least because we face both the climate crisis and a crisis of inequality, as the previous speakers have noted. And there is no conventional politics that can properly address both of these at the same time. Um, you can see this by the fact that though, though the, the science tells us that, that we have to phase out fossil fuels globally in only a few decades. What that means is that the countries of the global South must rapidly, very rapidly decarbonize even while they are still poor. And even if they have fossil resources that they hoped to extract and sell for their development, even then they have to decarbonize while their people are still poor. This, this demonstrates just how out of whack the governance systems are. Um, and, and I want to I want to also point out something that hasn't been mentioned, but which is very important and which is happening this year, which spotlights these issues, which is that there's a big fight brewing in Africa where the next conference of parties, the next climate summit will be, between governments that want to develop their fossil resources and civil society movements that want that want to keep those fossil resources in the ground and launch a crash, a crash program of renewable development. This conflict is sharp and visible in a new way, a way that's very different from the way it, it would have been seen even five years ago, which is a clear sign of the times. And it highlights the very key strategic nature of the international finance challenge, which MENA summarized so nicely. So in that context, I wanna just make a couple of points. Basically, there are two questions here. Who pays and for what? So let's take the second question first. How much international climate finance do we need and for what? Which climate costs should be internationally shared? I mean, we know it's not just mitigation costs. Certainly, we obviously, we have to share adaptation costs, absolutely. And, and we, we absolutely, as a matter of global justice, have to share loss and damage costs. Um, Mina summarized some of the early estimates for these costs, and the key point is that the number is in the trillions. Um, but that's not all. What about compensation to poor countries like Ecuador that possess but cannot develop fossil energy resources? Do they deserve compensation for refraining from the extraction of, of, of those resources? And if so, how can they receive it? And what about the big Middle Eastern oil producers? Do they deserve compensation for not continuing to pump out their oil? And if so, how much? And, and who pays that? And is that distributed? Is, is the liability for those, for those compensations the same as the liability for global loss and damage? And, and what about the costs of global just transition more generally? What about the costs of resettling the hundreds of millions of climate refugees that we're gonna have on the planet in 30 or 40 years? Which costs get shared? and within what kind of global justice storyline? This is a key question and it is absolutely on the agenda, which is amazing. We need, and, and we need to focus on it 
and, and get straight on it. But the big question, even if we determine what should be paid, is who pays? And here I wanna say very clearly that there are, there are three possibilities. One is the fossil corporations, one is the rich countries of the North, and the third is the rich people of the world. And so let's take them one at a time. First, the fossil corporations. I only mention this because, because in the backwash of Russia's war in the Ukraine, they are making massive and odious profits. And there are lots of people in civil society who, all over the world who want to push for windfall profit tax taxes on those pro profits for both tactical and strategic reasons. And I'm certainly not going to argue with them. The second possibility is that, is that the rich countries of the North should pay. Um, these countries obviously, and one way or another, have the greatest part of the bill, for they have the greatest historical responsibility and the greatest capacity to pay. I have no argument here either, though I do want to point out that there are lots of poor people in the countries of the North. There are, in fact, lots of people in the United States, the richest country the world has ever seen, who are poor by global standards. And at the same time, there are lots of rich people in the countries of the South. So the third possibility may be, maybe it's the rich people and not the rich countries that should pay. Now, now stay with me for a second. This is not as crazy as an idea as you might think, particularly if you follow the work of Thomas Piketty the author of Capital in the 21st Century and his colleagues at the World Inequality Database. I'm not gonna show any graphs here, though I could, but here's a thought experiment. What if we attack, what if we tax the emissions of just the richest 1% of the global population, regardless of where they live, at, at a rate high enough to pay the entire cost of the global emergency climate transition in its tens of trillions. Bottom line, about 6% of these luxury emissions come from China and it would have a significant fair share. But the US with about 57% of, of, the, of the global luxury emissions would have a far, far larger share about 10 times as large as China's. Um, this is an illuminating result, particularly if like Piketty, you believe that there is simply no way to stabilize the climate system without a progressive global climate tax, uh, which might be tied to special drawing rights, uh, uh, something we, we, uh, we might wanna talk about. To conclude, to conclude, if you're talking about nations, then the countries of the North absolutely have the largest fair shares or debts or whatever you wanna call them by a long shot. And we haven't got a chance unless this brute fact takes the spotlight and unless big money begins to flow. This is true even if you're focused on rich people rather than rich countries, because again, most of the rich people live in the rich countries, which is one of the reasons that inequalities within countries cannot be dropped out of the picture, which is absolutely key to the fair shares approach, which calculates both national historical responsibility and national capacity to pay in ways that are explicitly sensitive to inequality within countries. Notable fact here, Thomas Piketty and his colleagues argue that more than half the inequality in the planet, what, what is called global inequality, is now within countries rather than between countries. This matters. Nuances matter, particularly if we hope to win this thing. Um, I, I particularly recommend a book by Olafemi Otaiwo that is 
getting a, a bit of a buzz in the reparations, the climate reparations debate in the United States, in which he says that we need a constructive approach to reparations or to climate debt, as the case may be, a forward-looking approach, a world-building approach that supports mobilization and cooperation. I, I, I argue, I, I submit to you that such an approach cannot simply reference the climate debt uh, that the, the North owes to the South, huge though that absolutely is, but also has to spotlight the debt that is, or, or the responsibility to pay of the rich people wherever they live in whatever countries. Um, after all, the debt is still accumulating and, and we have to, we have to take that into account and I'll stop there. Muchísimas gracias, Tom. Eh, pues sí, realmente la, la perspectiva que asomas ¿no? es súper interesante en términos de también ver la no linealidad de, de, del abordaje ¿no? sobre la propia deuda, sobre norte, sobre sur, etc. Eh, y también, bueno, pensando ¿no? en lo que nos, conté, no, nos hablaba Mina, que tiene que ver con, con la historicidad ¿no? eh, sobre el propio problema, ¿no? Eh, ¿Hasta qué punto puede, puede la búsqueda de nuevas soluciones seguir conservando ¿no? el, el, eh, la memoria sobre estas deudas, por ejemplo? Eh, ¿Y cómo eso podría pues, mezclarse en ¿no? esas perspectivas, por, eh, por decir un ejemplo? No sé si alguno eh, de los participantes ha dejado alguna pregunta en, en la parte de comentarios eh, y preguntas. Eh, John, por si quisieras comentarnos por allí si hay algo y si no, igual eh, vamos ahorita, me gustaría también que pudiésemos, que pudiesen Alberto, eh, en relación a lo que estaba diciendo Tom, Tom a lo que estaba diciendo Mina, pues eh, poder discutir un poco más algunos puntos que me parecen importantes así que escuchemos a ver algunas de las preguntas y eh, luego discutamos también un poco entre nosotros, sigamos conversando John Thank you, Liliana. We have one question. Uh, Mina uh, began to answer it, but um, it's from David Schwartzman. And he, he asks, please discuss how the global anti-imperialist and anti-war movements can contribute to the cancellation of debt and the implement implementation of reparations owed to the global South from the countries in the global North most responsible for the increasing threat of catastrophic climate change. So how to connect the anti-imperialist and anti-war movements to, to this question of debt cancellation? That's the question. Gracias, John. Si alguno quisiera, por favor, Mina, creo que podías iniciar un poco porque tiene, tiene relación con lo que venías hablando. Yeah, um, no, well, I certainly agree. I think what David is um, driving at is a very important question and I put it in the chat as well. I mean, in the response, we do need to connect all the movements. Um, and, I, and I want to just say how these connections can be done uh, within the context of what both Alberto and uh, Tom were talking about. Um, we cannot be working in silos anymore. This is not just about a climate justice movement, a tax justice movement, a debt justice movement, um, or even a trade justice movement. I think I want to start from the or a war anti-war movement. I think we are all connected, and I, I and I want to start from where uh, Alberto was talking about in terms of the transformation that is needed, in terms of the changing the production system, changing the consumption patterns. And these, you know, changing production systems and consumption patterns uh, evolved already in the Rio summit in 1992. You know, if you look at the Rio declaration, it's all in there. But, um, you know, since we have identified the cause of the problem as a the capitalist model, which continues to perpetuate itself and reinvent itself. Um, so I think that, that to answer the question is that we need to connect both the North and the South, particularly the poor of the North and the poor of the South. 
And I definitely agree with Tom on that, that the South also, the rich elite, um, are also responsible. But you can't, you, the, the system itself, the capitalist system, which was exported to our countries, we may have had economic independence, I mean, political independence, but in terms of the economies of uh, or the investment, is, uh, you know, the way we invest or with with all these trade agreements, free, we didn't even talk about the free trade agreements, which actually lock in. There is the Bretton Woods, the, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, the free trade agreements. These are all instruments that transform our societies to follow and, and lock in a kind of development model which takes us away from what Alberto was talking about in terms of a real solutions world to a false solution world. And the, cap, the, the whole um, climate discourse at the moment in terms of the solutions, we didn't even talk about that yet. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And I want to say that the, this, the, the powers that be, the same, same fossil fuel corporations, I mean, taxing them alone will never be enough because they will be taxed, they can be taxed if at all we can tax them. But even if we tax them, they'll continue to produce and pollute. So it's, it's not about allowing them to continue to pollute. It's about Trans is shifting away. It's about new systems. And um, this is where Alberto talked about in terms of connecting the, I mean, how do you enable that energy transition, a new kind of systems and so on. And I want to say that those who are still in power, the, the elite of the North with their corporations are now looking at geoengineering. How do you remove these carbon emissions from the atmosphere from a technical solution by coming with new uh, ideas of geoengineering. And it is crazy. How do you remove these carbon dioxide with um, energy, I mean, to, with, with new forms, including bioenergy, carbon capture, new plantations, nature-based solutions. There's this big talk about nature-based solutions, about carbon offsets. What they are talking about basically is that, oh, you can continue to, to emit one ton, you can sequester another ton by planting trees and so on, and then you have engineering and biological solutions, all of which, which is crazy, because it will never solve the problem because you can't just have techno fixes like this, and they're even scientifically flawed. And it's actually about another kind of colonialism, the name of nature, which is more colonialism, taking over our natural resources through carbon offset. So they're inventing all this. And it's not invention, it's real. It's being advocated right now. It's even in, in the discussions, which is as we go towards the COP. So it's really very dangerous. So how do we veer away from the false solutions to the right solutions? And I just want to say, I think we need to look at it in terms of how, what can be done in terms of protecting those systems which are still intact that Alberto talked about. In many of our countries, the large fr last frontiers are in the hands of indigenous peoples, local communities, the forests, the oceans, and now these are all under grab, land grabs, through all these other false solutions. So we need to protect that. And those of us who are in the South are fighting our own governments not to go in the wrong way. But this is alone not enough because the international systems, just one example, free trade agreements which allow corporations to sue governments for doing the right thing. Ecuador knows this, Alberto knows this more than anybody else. Even when you want to, to, to go into uh, the right solution by moving away from fossil fuels, you will have the fossil fuel corporations of the North using the investor state system to sue the government um, to do from doing the right thing. So we are fighting a huge monster. And this is where coming back to you, David, we need to find the solution, connecting all our movements, both in the North and the South, because we are fighting the same system, which is producing the inequality, the climate crisis, the environmental crisis, and the crisis of, of, of um, inequality. So I, I, I think, uh, well, if we can go on, but I think I've said enough for now. Muchas gracias, Mina. Muchas gracias. Eh, no sé si de pronto Alberto quisiera también agregar algo a lo que se está um, comentando. Caspi, please. I just... 
as a point of clarification, I just want to clarify. I, I didn't mean I didn't mean to imply that I thought that taxation would suffice to stop fossil fuels. Um, I my point was that we needed lots of money. We need lots of money. And as has been noted earlier in this conversation, with so many of the governments going neo-fascist, it's, it's not really very likely that we're gonna get the money, the, the tens of trillions of dollars that we need out of the central bankers in the next couple of years. So, so I, think, I think we're all very, very interested in Mia Motley's proposal that there be half a trillion dollars in SDRs issued every year and that th that would provide real money to, to provision the climate transition. What I'm saying is that you can't just print that money. That money is going to have to come from the rich. This is complicated how exactly it would be done. But I, I just think it's, extre it's extremely important that, that the, con the luxury consumption of the super rich be made a very big issue on this planet. And there is really no way to do that except by taxing it. And so, so not that the taxation is in and of itself going to solve the problem, but it is for at a variety of levels, it is absolutely necessary for there to be a sense that there's a just world being built. You know, if, if we just increase the, you know, there has to be a sense that the rich are being reined in. If people do not have that sense, nothing is going to work. That, and I, that's all I wanted to say. Gracias, Tom. Bien, hay algunas preguntas. Me gustaría de, aportar de, en algo. Que están en el, en el. Sí, por favor, Alberto, tienes la palabra. Me gustaría hacer algunas apuntaciones que me parecen importantes. Rescataría en primer lugar lo que señaló Mena. Todo está conectado. La realidad del mundo que vivimos tiene que ver con una historia de explotación. Ese es el telón de fondo de esta historia. Y nuestras sociedades, tanto en el norte como en el sur, están plagadas por una serie de deudas. Deudas que tienen una larga historia. Por eso hablamos de deudas eternas. Hay deudas coloniales, hay deudas financieras, hay deudas patriarcales, sociales y ecológicas. Todas esas deudas están de una u otra manera interconectadas. Para enfrentar esas deudas, creo yo que hay muchas soluciones y muchas opciones que habría que discutir. He escuchado algunas de las propuestas formuladas por Tom y también Emena mencionó algunos elementos en esa dirección. El primer punto que tenemos que tener claro es Cuidado con las falsas soluciones. Nicolás Maquiavelo, en su libro clásico del príncipe, escribía hace más de 500 años que hay que conocer los caminos del infierno para evitarlo. Entonces la gran tarea aquí es no caer en las falsas soluciones. Por ejemplo, estas medidas que se nos venden para la conservación, para la remediación, que a la postre son otras formas de desposesión y otras formas de acumulación. Como señalaban, son otras formas de colonialismo. Piensen ustedes en lo que representan las famosas energías de colores, la ener la, con, perdón, las economías de colores, la economía verde, la economía naranja, la economía azul. Son visiones economicistas para seguir sosteniendo el sistema y para no para resolver los problemas. Una de las mayores perversidades que hay es la de los mercados de carbono. Mientras sigamos nosotros mercantilizando la naturaleza y mercantilizando la vida de los seres humanos, no hay soluciones de fondo, son simplemente parches. Un tercer elemento, no podemos esperar reeditar el estilo de vida de los países ricos. Si un habitante promedio del mundo 
y ese fuera el elemento referencial para todos quienes vivimos sobre la tierra, produjera y consumiera como un habitante promedio en los Estados Unidos, vamos a requerir más de cinco planetas. Eso no tiene futuro. Les voy a dar una cifra que para mí fue siempre un mensaje muy claro. China consumió en tres años, 2011, 2012, 2013, 6,615 millones de toneladas de cemento. 1.5 veces más que lo que consumieron los Estados Unidos en todo el siglo XX. No hay tanta espacio en esta tierra para tanta codicia, para ese ritmo de acumulación. Y entonces ahí tenemos que abordar algunas cosas. Un punto fundamental, hay que impugnar, hay que cancelar la deuda externa financiera. Hay suficientes razones para eso. Si tuviera tiempo, les puedo hasta demostrar que esa deuda financieramente hablando ya está pagada. Pero hay doctrinas de las deudas odiosas, de las deudas usurarias, de las deudas corruptas. Deberíamos frenar todos los nuevos créditos que se están negociando para seguir aumentando, por ejemplo, la explotación de minerales, de petróleo, la agroindustria que es para la exportación. Y desde esa perspectiva nosotros tendríamos inclusive que pedir algo que me parece clave y fundamental. ¿Por qué no nos tratan a los países endeudados del sur global e incluso del sur de Europa, como les trataron a los alemanes luego de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Les dejo a que revisen el Acuerdo de Londres del 27 de febrero de 1953, un acuerdo que se sustentó en la capacidad de pago de Alemania, que había sido dos veces causante de dos guerras mundiales, al país que le ayudaron a resolver sus problemas por razones de geopolítica. ¿Por qué a los países del sur global no se les da un tratamiento similar? ¿Por qué no pensamos en un tribunal internacional de auditoría de la deuda externa? Que ha sido discutido en Naciones Unidas. Esas son propuestas concretas. ¿Por qué no damos paso a un impuesto Tobin para grabar a los flujos especulativos a nivel global? Y en ese contexto yo coincido con, con Tom cuando dice que el que más gana y el que más tiene, no solo a nivel global, sino a nivel nacional, tiene que aportar más. Y ahí tenemos nosotros que ir un poco más allá simplemente de una reforma tributaria. ¿Cuándo acabamos con los paraísos fiscales? ¿Hasta cuándo vamos a seguir confiando en los tratados de libre comercio? Mena tiene toda razón, que no tienen que ver no solo con comercio y que no son libres, son otras formas de dominación. Y entonces, aquí hay propuestas muy interesantes. El presidente Petro, en Naciones Unidas, en un discurso de hace muy pocos días, dijo ¿Por qué no se cancela la deuda externa o se anula gran parte de la deuda externa de los países amazónicos para que estos países protejan la Amazonía. Esta es una propuesta que en Ecuador se formuló a inicios de este siglo, ya son más de 20 años, y me entusiasmó que el presidente Petro esté trabajando en esa dirección. Y luego hay que comenzar a trabajar, y también lo dijo Tom, sobre la necesidad de dejar los combustibles fósiles en el subsuelo. Nosotros en Ecuador impulsamos la iniciativa Yasuní TT para dejar el petróleo en el subsuelo. ¿Y cuál era el punto de partida ahí? Que los países ricos tienen que aportar más para que se pueda hacer esa realidad, a partir de un principio fundamental, de la responsabilidad compartida. Todos somos responsables de proteger el equilibrio ecológico en el planeta, pero los países ricos y las élites de los países ricos y de los países del sur global son aún mucho más responsables. Y recordemos lo que dice la Agencia Internacional de la Energía, que hay que dejar en el subsuelo las dos terceras partes de, los de las reservas de los combustibles fósiles conocidas, sea petróleo, gas o carbón, si no queremos que la temperatura del planeta supere el límite de 1.52 grados. Esos son retos que tenemos y en ese escenario la gran tarea es entender que requerimos otra transición energética, otro manejo de la economía, liberarnos de la religión del crecimiento económico permanente y liberarnos de la dependencia de los extractivismos. Pero eso no será suficiente si seguimos haciendo más de lo mismo. Más de lo mismo será más de lo peor. Concluyo, es necesario entonces estar claro de que hay muchas deudas y hay que inter establecer interconexiones entre estas deudas eternas y debemos ir asumiendo que los países del sur somos los acreedores de muchas de esas deudas, incluso de los efectos de la deuda financiera, 
que provoca destrozos sociales, de la deuda ecológica, de las deudas históricas. Pero todos los seres humanos, sobre todo los hombres, tenemos que resolver ese gravísimo problema de la deuda patriarcal. Así es, gracias Alberto. Tu intervención además asoma creo yo un punto muy importante que tiene que ver con inter las interconexiones entre el colapso climático y, y otros espacios de discusión de otras crisis como la pérdida de la biodiversidad, los propios problemas alimentarios de la crisis global alimentario, las guerras por el agua que se están generando en medio de una de las más grandes crisis hídricas globales que estamos atravesando precisamente y esas interconexiones. Um, que son muy interesantes. Por acá había una pregunta que un poco ya la, la me parece que, que, que la han discutido, pero bueno, voy, a, voy un poco a leer, ¿no? Porque está interesante. How do we get from here to there if an election like, the, like in the US means politicians will do whatever it takes to reduce oil prices? And I want You faded out there a bit, Liliana. Así es. Um, creo que se leyó bien en los dos idiomas la pregunta, me parece, Heather. Sí, um, o me quedé un poco congelada porque tenía mi audio en español. Pero mero, eh, no sé si la vuelvo a leer nuevamente y lo hago en español. Ya no sé si se escuchó. Estuvo uh, bien la, half of it. la pregunta. Muy bien. Bueno, eh, si quisieran un poco contestar a, a Carl que hace esta pregunta, Carl Barton, a través de nuestra chat de preguntas. ¿Qué va? Te confronto un poco lo que se discutía al principio, ¿no? Eh, cómo precisamente la situación de guerra en este momento eh, eh, incrementa, ¿no? E intensifica la deuda debido a, a, a los altos costos por la comida y la energía en el sur global. Eh, y que no es de interés de los grupos de poder hacer ningún cambio. Eh, 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 y en esta intersección de crisis, ¿sí? que les eh, dirige ¿no? y que les lleva eh, precisamente a una explotación de más combustibles fósiles. Entonces, esta relación entre guerra e intensificación de la deuda debido al eh, aumento de eh, los costos de energía y comida en el sur global. ¿no? ¿Cómo ven un poco la situación? I think Mina has her hand up. Mm -hmm. Muy bien, Mina. It, it's a very important question. And by no way am I able to um, answer all of it, but I think we know the answers, right? Um, as overwhelming as it may seem, and you're absolutely right, where governments, you know, elections have produced led to the wrong kinds of people in power. And even if you get the right kind of people or you think you got the right kind of people, they are not able to do anything because of all the, um, you know, all the ways in which capital behaves. And, you know, so, so it's very interesting to see what's going on in Latin America. And uh, maybe that's where I want to start um, with President Petro, as um, Alberto had talked about. I mean, Coming from um, Colombia and uh, a history of very difficult situation, 
and wanting to do something right. The same that is that's that's happening in Chile and and uh, we understand you know um, what's going on in Brazil and so there seems to be some hope in that part of the world. But certainly they are all very constrained with huge amounts of debt. I think that's really the biggest problem because of history of neoliberal um, econ economics and the free trade agreements which have um, to a large extent with different levels of in the continent has locked them into systems that are going to be very, very difficult to get out of. So I do think that this is a challenge for us. And um, but we do need to because you have leaders now who are talking about a new kind of development model, the kind that Alberto is talking about post extractivism, post fossil fuels, very difficult to do. But I think it, I think the solutions are there. Um, but they are not easy. So there are structures internationally that we have to be dismantled. And that is as what Alberto was saying. And this is where we keep coming back to the question of having to fight to dismantle some of the structures like getting canceling the debts. Very, very key. That, that's a very important demand. Actually, I would urge all of you, if you don't know already, there was a fantastic UN, it was unbelievable as it may seem, during the time of Father Miguel Descoto of Nicaragua, at that time in the UN General Assembly, there was a special session on economic and financial um, uh, uh, topics. Uh, and if you look at that outcome document, a lot of the proposals that we are talking about were and was actually out of that process. Amazing, amazing proposals, which are actually quite radical. Um, and of course, the the rich world just dumped it into the dustbin. But for those of us who are advocates, we can recover that decision. And I think we need to build on them because it actually came through the, the solidarity between the group of 77 and China with many of us working with the governments there and with fantastic proposals on how do you actually negotiate debt. You, for, the, for the longest time, there is no international system even today to actually negotiate debt settlement and, uh, and, and a debt workout mechanism. And so the, the, that particular um, decision was actually very good. And uh, the, along the lines of what uh, President Petro is talking about. So we do need to bring this back and recover this and, and, uh, and uh, work with it um, in terms of assisting a lot of the progressive governments. And of course, the free trade agreements, many of us also had worked in Latin America on, and, and in fact, it was the, um, uh, I think it was the uh, Ecuador government as well. And many years ago, I recall my own uh, late husband, Martin Kaur, we had visited Ecuador and others. And there was proposals for how do you actually relook at all these investor state, um, you know, bilateral investment agreements and so on. So there are a lot of proposals out there and a lot of groups. There are trade justice movements who have been working on these and I think that the point is that it's not a, for the lack of solutions. There are solutions, including on attacking the international system and, 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 uh, um, and, and really um, moving forward. But I just want to finally say that this energy transition we are talking about, um, the point that you know, there's this just energy transition that, that has now, um, even the US is now talking about a just energy transition. But if you look at the just energy transition that is being, our, um, you know, again, the devil is in the detail. It sounds fantastic. It sounds like they have, you know, there was this just energy transition partnership which was um, announced in Glasgow. But if you look at what that is in there, apparently it was just a repackaging of what money the South Africans already had. It was not new additional money. It was about loans. And it's about foreign companies again. The whole, the whole attempt really is to continue to control so it is through finance, but the finance comes with conditions and it's really with the technologies of the North. It's not about liberating the South at all. So I think, I think we need to have a longer conversation. I think it's a good, this is a good um, um, a debate or a good webinar that uh, the Global um, Policy Initiative of um, uh, Institute for Policy Studies had done. I think we need to have more conversations, particularly in the United States and in Europe and in the UK. How do we connect the progressive movements there? Because those of us in the South, and I'm sure Alberto will agree with me, we can do as much as we want and even bring in progressive governments into power, but without 
the the burden of the northern governments in keeping with their with their structures and instruments to continue to subjugate over us, we are not going to have any change here. So the real change that really has to happen is in the North and that can only come with massive progressive solidarity and progressive movements in the North, working for your own interest and working in our interest as well because our cause is common and the problem is common. So I think that, um, that, that that's what we need to do. And I hope we can have more opportunities for that. But there's a lot of solutions out there, not just little, little solutions, but really big macro solutions, which are there in various uh, parts of, of, of the society, social movements. And I, I think we need to reconnect and rediscover and push and uh, continue this positive effort because we are saving ourselves and the planet. Así es. Han surgido enormes, eh, bueno, muchísimos intentos también de, de poder visibilizar estos debates del sur. Eh, hay muchos espacios de diálogos entre los sur-sur, pero sí sentimos desde, obviamente, el Pacto Ecosocial del Sur y el proyecto de transiciones justas del IPS, que eh, este es un momento clave para precisamente pensar el tema de las transiciones, de estas soluciones respecto, o bueno, de las iniciativas frente a las falsas soluciones instalándose en nuevas zonas de sacrificio en los sures globales eh, y que ciertamente es necesario el diálogo norte-sur, eh, entre sures, los nortes de los sures, los sures de los nortes, etcétera, ¿no? Porque ya como asumaba Tom, ¿no? También al interno de, de los diversos territorios y espacios, eh, las tensiones asoman precisamente entre élites y los más afectados que son precisamente eh, lo, 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 los que están en situaciones de, de profunda este, inequidad. Eh, les pregunto un poco, ¿no? ¿Cómo ven eh, la situación con respecto a próximamente la COP? ¿Sí? Eh, y esta discusión en torno a las deudas, ya Mina nos conversaba un poco cómo estaba, pero sí... Eh, Creemos que hay ciertas tensiones, bueno, hay unas tensiones muy fuertes con respecto a la forma en que esta además COP se está haciendo, dónde se está haciendo, la posibilidad de incidir en este espacio y la eh, constante eh, denuncia ¿no? a la inacción de estos espacios. Uh, han surgido desde eh, diversos lugares de movimientos, eh, entre diálogos, posibilidades de espacios paralelos desde la sociedad civil, pero que realmente la pregunta es hasta dónde podrían incidir sobre estos espacios. Aunque esto abre otro gran espacio, ¿no? ya estamos como cerrando. Sí, pues brevemente, ¿no? Como, ¿cuáles son esas expectativas hacia poder colocar realmente el tema de la deuda eh, ecológica en el marco? de la crisis socioambiental, como más o menos se ha expuesto en este espacio, en ese espacio, eh, que seguramente tendrá muchos diálogos entre sí. movimientos que puedan estar. Tom. In the discussions that are going on within the Climate Action Network International, which is, has become much more, more of a progressive organization than it was in the past, it's changed along with the world, right? I mean, the big issue obviously is loss and damage finance. And, and, and to the extent that the civil, the civil society movements are gonna have a single singular focus at, at, uh, at the COP, it's gonna be winning the battle of loss and damage finance. And, and um, obviously that's tied to the, 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 the fact that the basic problem of climate justice has become visible, which is that the, the, the parts of the world that emitted all the carbon dioxide are not the parts of the world that are suffering as much, as much. Though, though as you see now, a, a, a near cat five hurricane is, is just grinding its way through, through the United States, which, which, which raises the other thing, the other thing that's going on in these negotiations is that We have to understand that there are two simultaneous reckonings going on. One is the reckoning about North-South justice. That is absolutely happening. It's completely different 
than five years ago. I mean, I don't know if you would agree with this, Mina or Alberta, but to me, the tone of the conversation is completely different. Everybody knows. Maybe Pakistan was the turning point. But the other thing that's going on is that the scientists are panicking. I really want to emphasize this. This has not been discussed enough at this at, at the, in this conversation. The scientists are panicking. Now, I'm not going to go through the details. You know the details, but you know it's possible that the temperature is going to hit very briefly, very briefly, 1.5 in only two years. You know it will be the end of the decade before we're solidly at 1.5, and and. And, and then, and at that point, things get very, very dangerous. And this is also changing the political dynamics, right? And so, so the question I have, I, I want to sort of connect this to what Mina was talking about, debt cancellation, and how there's these really good ideas for how to renegotiate that and, 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 and tie, and, and, and to get to Alberto's thing, to tie the, the renegotiation of debt to nature protection in, in critical areas like Yasuni, right? It's, it's the question is, and I don't know the answer, and I don't think anybody here knows the answer. The question is, does the emergency itself, the climate emergency itself, and, and which is becoming manifest in the fires and the floods, and, and when the Thwaites Glacier goes, the, the Th Thwaites Glacier is, is gonna raise, sea level everywhere is gonna rise, right? And does, does this change the political dynamic? The question is, given the manifest nature of the emergency, do things that were, do, 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 does radical change that was previously completely off the agenda find its way onto the agenda in a new way. And that to me is a question that's because, I think that question is going to be manifest at the COP in a way that it never was before. It is certainly manifest in the American climate movement in a way that it never was before. People know neoliberal economics has got to go and not just street, pe street fighting people, Everybody knows, and how did what new channels of cooperation and resistance and transformation does this open up? I think it's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Gracias, Tom. Brevemente, Mina y Alberto, para poder cerrar un poco con con esta idea, ¿no? Que nos pone Tom sobre sobre la mesa. Empezaría yo anotando algo que me parece que es necesario aceptar. No está en el interés de los poderosos perder sus privilegios. No está en el interés del poder perder esa condición con la cual le permite dominar el planeta a los seres humanos, a las mujeres, a los pueblos y a la misma naturaleza. Ese creo que es un punto básico. Sin embargo, y ahí coincido con Tom, hay un creciente sentimiento de preocupación, de angustia, no solo en los científicos, sino en otros sectores de la población. E inclusive comenzaron a aparecer tímidos atisbos de solución a los problemas. Piensen ustedes todo lo que fue y ha sido hasta hace muy poco tiempo atrás la propuesta de transformación energética, sobre todo en Europa una transformación energética corporativa que estaba tomando distancia de la energía nuclear, estaba tomando distancia de los reactores a carbón, estaba tomando distancia de algunos elementos que configuraban escenarios de carbonización de la atmósfera. Aparece la guerra provocada por la invasión rusa a Ucrania y gran parte de esos objetivos desaparecen del escenario, o ya no son más los principales. Se comienza nuevamente a aceptar la energía nuclear, la energía de carbón, inclusive se aceptan cuestiones que se creía ya superadas. Y con eso vemos no solo que hay un cambio de los objetivos, sino una 
distracción de los recursos que son necesarios para enfrentar los problemas de fondo. Y entonces ahora se comienza a invertir enorme cantidad de dinero en armas, un verdadero desperdicio, porque con las armas no vamos a conseguir la paz entre los seres humanos y menos la paz con la naturaleza. Esto está incrementando los problemas financieros, el endeudamiento externo, los problemas se agravan por el lado del hambre, y el tema del hambre, lo dejo ahí señalado, no es una cuestión de falta de producción, porque hay suficientes alimentos para todos los habitantes en el planeta, pero se prefiere, por ejemplo, con los biocombustibles, alimentar a los automóviles, hay una enorme especulación en los mercados de cereales y es un desperdicio enorme de recursos, tanto en el norte global como en el sur global. Pero lo que a mí me preocupa es el hecho este de que este rato, conociendo esas limitaciones y reconociendo que hay una mayor conciencia, la tarea es desnudar esa realidad perversa del poder. Esta guerra de Ucrania, que yo rechazo la invasión rusa sin rodeos, nos oculta otras guerras. ¿Quién habla de las otras guerras en el sur global? En Yemen, por ejemplo, en Irak, en Libia, en Siria, en Mali, en Palestina. ¿Quién habla de la guerra en, en Marruecos, de ese pueblo polisario que quiere liberarse? Son guerras que no interesan. Y la humanidad, el poder, pongámoslo así, el poder político y el poder económico, tiene capacidad para resolver muchos de esos problemas. Eso es indudable. Les voy a dar un ejemplo y voy a ir cerrando ya porque el tiempo apremia. Nos pusimos de acuerdo los seres humanos, primera persona de plural, me ubico entre los seres humanos, para enfrentar el COVID con vacunas. Y en muy poco tiempo se desarrollaron las vacunas. Pueden ser buenas o malas, no voy a discutir. Yo ya estoy vacunado, no voy a discutir el tema. Pero hay otra enfermedad que es gravísima, que afecta a millones de personas cada año, que no tiene vacuna. La malaria afectó el año pasado a 241 millones de personas y esto se da año tras año y no hay vacuna para la malaria. Entonces estamos frente a un mundo en el cual el poder solo está preocupado de acumular. Y entonces el resultado es que los problemas irán cada vez peores. En ese contexto, personalmente, reconociendo que hay una creciente conciencia sobre los problemas ambientales, que hay preocupaciones en muchas partes del planeta, no solo a nivel científico, sino incluso a nivel político, no tengo mucha expectativa de la cumbre de cambio climático en Egipto. Va a ser otra oportunidad de grandes discursos, de mucha retórica y de pocas acciones concretas. Sin embargo, no pierdo el optimismo porque veo que en distintas partes del mundo, en el sur global y en el norte global, la gente se organiza para resistir y para reexistir. Está diciendo no a tanta destrucción y está diciendo sí a otras formas de vida a través de las cuales nosotros tenemos que ir construyendo desde abajo lo que podría ser una democracia global. Pensar en lo local y actuar en lo local. Pensar en lo nacional y actuar en lo nacional. Pensar en lo internacional y global y actuar en lo internacional y global es el gran reto que tenemos entre manos. Muchas gracias, Alberto. Bueno, Mina, tienes las palabras de cierre muy brevecito. Ya estamos un poquito pasados de tiempo, pero vamos a ir cerrando eh, con tus ideas. ¿no? Thank you. Um, it's always very good to speak at Uh, Alberto. Um, yes, uh, the friends of... Oh, I'm hearing my own... Um, uh, yeah, Heather, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to say that at, at the end of the day, we are, despite all the odds and challenges, um, I think this webinar today did actually focus on the, on, the, on the core of the current system and how we are actually all about transforming this current system and system change in the real way and not just In, in rhetorics. So it's about mobilizing, it's about resisting, it's about transforming. That actually is the Friends of the Earth International mantra um, of which we all believe in. So mobilize, resist, transform for real systems change. And so what we, what definitely the last thing I want to say is that as we've already emphasized, we need to connect. And Alberto, even, uh, you know, we know that the COP is not actually um, always very inspiring. But it's a contested space that we have to be in. And as you said, 
We have to be there no matter what the little outcomes that we see there, but because we hold governments to account to international treaties. And that's the only thing that we have in terms of any kind of accountability um, with the convention and the Paris Agreement, and no matter how little that is there, that's the only way you hold some of these governments and expose them and denounce them and, pre and be prepared to ensure that the false solutions do not get even more entrenched than they already are. So in that sense, we really need the knowledge. We need to, um, there are solutions out there. We need to connect. All I want to say is that um, let's continue to connect and work together. I don't know what's going to happen after this, but I certainly look forward to more connections. And so many of us are gathering in, in COP27 and the climate justice movement is already very, the, the global campaign to demand climate justice has already talked about and, and, is, and is very um, foundational that you have to connect to tax, uh, tax justice, debt justice, trade justice, anti-war movements. And I just want to say that the war itself, and somebody is talking about um, these powerful powers that be, it's all about, and if you see what's taunting about China, taunting China with Taiwan, it's all the military industrial complex as we know it. The Lockheeds and all the others who continue to love war so they can make more money. And so that is, uh, it's an attack on the, on the humanity and an attack on the planet as well. So we have to stop this. So we have to continue to mobilize, resist and transform and good luck to all of us. And um, I certainly hope that we will have more energy to continue the struggles that we do. And um, thank you. Muchísimas gracias a los tres. Ha sido un espacio muy nutritivo de una conversación muy rica que esperemos que no pare acá. Como dice Mina, como dice Tom, como dice Alberto, seguimos generando espacios de eh, conversación y sobre todo con el compromiso de generar otros modos de ser con la naturaleza eh, y de poder generar espacios para buscar juntas, juntos desde los pueblos y con los pueblos soluciones justas, reales, además. Así que bueno, un gran abrazo, nos despedimos y, y bueno, que estén todos muy bien, buenas noches. Buenas noches. Thank you, Liliana. Bien hecho. <laughs> Maybe we are live still. I've no. It doesn't matter. It'll be cut. I, I can. <laughs>